Once upon a time, once underneath a time, there was a place full of magic. And there was a village in this place. And in this village, somehow, they had forgotten about magic. Because magic abandoned them. Two sorcerers lived there. Every village had their sorcerers, their shamans. And these two were married. And one day, lightning struck, and they disappeared. And that way, that's how they abandoned the village. But more than that, they also left behind their only child, who was a boy. Now, the village went about trying to figure out, who's going to take care of this boy? No one wanted to. Everybody was afraid. They thought, why? Why'd they leave a boy behind? Did, did the boy, was the boy somehow responsible for their deaths or for their disappearance? For no one really knew what happened to them. And so what happened was they decided they should banish the boy from their fears. They set this five-year-old boy out walking in the jungles, knowing it was going to be his end. And there's a few people in there that had a, in the village that had a turn of heart, maybe out of love and maybe out of fear, but they, they, would, they would sneak up and make sure that the boy was really okay, that he had some scraps of food to feed on. And the, the boy wandered a long, long way to the very edges of this place, and he found a hut. And inside the hut, there lived an old woman. The old woman was blind. Something about a blind person is that, to them, day and night is the same. And the boy learned this. Before they got together, she accepted him. She could use the help. And he needed somebody. And she raised him and learned to love him as, his, as her own son. And, and something about her allowed him to be totally unafraid of the dark and of the night. He took, actually, to, uh, to staying up all night and sleeping during the day. And that's the way he lived his life. One day, the old woman had passed on, and he mourned her. And then years went on, and he knew how to take care of himself until he got to the point where he was about ooh, 17, 18, and other things were waking up in his body and in his heart and in his soul, and he longed for a girl. And maybe the only thing more than that he longed for was to be accepted again in that village that he barely remembers. And so one night he's it, the, uh, it, staring up at the stars as he always does, and there's one particular star, one particular star that he's so in love with in a way. He, he doesn't understand what it is about the star, but it makes him, feel, makes him feel warm inside, makes him feel like perhaps he has a home. And he prays to this star. And that particular night, he prays to this star, and he says, oh, if only, if only I could find a girl that is as beautiful as you, star. If only, if only I could have you with me all day as well as all night, then, then that would be everything.
That very same night that he sang that song to Star, he's walking along familiar trails, and he trips over something. And he looks back to see what it was that he had tripped over, and there's something glittering down there, just, just poking up out of the soil. So he digs it out, and what does he find? He finds a glass bottle, multifaceted, and he picks it up to the light, to the starlight, and in every facet, he sees the glimmer of that one beautiful star that he loves, as well as all the other stars. And he's turning it in his amazement. It's a magical thing. He took that as a sign. Ah, it came to him then. What he can do is he could make a sacred brew and to thank the spirits, to thank the star. He takes this thing back to his hut. And he washes it out. And then... As his grandmother taught him, grandmother, that's what he called the, uh, the blind woman. As his grandmother taught him, he set it down, he poured river water in, and then he proceeded to put all these magical herbs and mushrooms inside of it in, in a way that he was taught. And he leaves it open, hoping that spirit will fall into it. So that he does. And that is called his ritual. And then he falls to sleep and waits.
So fascinating magic it is that the star all this time heard the boy's prayers ever since he started doing that. And star thought, ah, there's a doorway opened. I can come down to earth. She can fit into this bottle. She could maybe be with him all day. She could be with him all night. So star decides to fall. She falls and then lands on light feet in the heart of a feather. It's a beautiful girl. Around her neck, she wears a pendant, the crescent moon is its jewel. And she dips down in the crescent jewel, the moon dips right into that brew. And so she invests her own spirit within the brew. And then she lightly goes to hide and wait for Starboy, who we're calling now Starboy, the boy. He's going to wake up. He does wake up and he notices there's something different. You know, living alone for so long, you kind of know when maybe someone's been around. He, maybe, maybe he picked up her fragrance, I don't know. But he looked at the bottle and he thought, why not? He picked up the bottle and he prayed seven directions and he took a little swig and already its potency was pretty strong and he sits down a little dizzy and he sees someone at the doorway he looks closer and it's a girl he jumps up walks over to the girl and says someone's visiting me you're beautiful he wants to kiss her but he says stop stop you have to remember one thing. I am the star you prayed to. I have come for you. But you must remember, never let the sunlight touch this brew, or it turns to poison. She says, so every morning, you've got to tap the bottle, tap it, and put it away out of the sunlight. And every evening when the sun has gone down, you can take it out and I will come out and we can be together all night. Now you have it all. He was totally fascinated, astonished as you can imagine. And just at that moment, the sun was starting to rise and she says, oh, it's time. I'm going to go now. I'll see you tomorrow night. She said that kind of in a luring way and I got him pretty excited. And dutifully, he went to the bottle and he closed it up. And having a little bit of that inside him, it was pretty easy for him just to fall right to sleep. So the next night is the second time they meet. He does wake up just past, just past nightfall. And uh, he's very anxious to see her. He sees the brew, he picks it up, prays to the seven directions and takes another drink. And then, wow, there she is again at the doorway. And she's even more beautiful than the last time. She's so gorgeous. And so he goes out and she takes her hand and they start speaking words of love to one another. And they start walking outside to the jungle. Oh, and it's so wonderful. At one point, the boy just swears that they're strolling across the Milky Way, all around them, the stars, and he could see the earth far below.
Do you feel that? Do you feel that celestial love thing going on there? It's a, uh, so the boy, obviously, oh, they're walking along, and down there they point, they point, there, there's a spot. We can go down there and lay down together. So they walk down to the spot in the jungle, this clearing spot. It's beautiful, and there's water trickling somewhere, and the stars are overhead. And uh, they begin just before they touch, though, war drums. War drums. The star sees the look on the boy's face of fear. War drums, an attacking tribe. She says, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And he goes, no, no, let me go with you. And he, she, she insists, already, you forget who I am. So. She goes off, and as he watches her go off, he feels at that moment, oh, point at the spear point, right back. He tries to look around and see who it is, and the warrior there says, don't move if you value your life, and don't look me in the eye. Who? I know who you are, and you don't know who I am. But I remember a long time ago, there was a sorcerer boy who left our village. And word has it that he's come out here. Last night, a few in our village saw a star fall from the sky. And tonight, war drums. What's going on? The chief wants to know what you have to do with all of this. And the boy says, star? I never saw a star fall. I was sleeping. But he says, but I am in love with a star. And the, and the warrior, of course, goes, ha, what? You love a star? Obviously, and the, and the warrior thinks he's coming to this crazy kid. Doesn't really know. But uh, the warrior continues on and says, Ah, yeah, okay. Right. You love a star. Anyway, it doesn't look like there's anything wrong here. I won't see any, choice of fi any traces of fire. So you just take care of yourself. And because there's, there's some war about. And the warrior proceeds to leave. A few moments later, Star comes back with the report. She says, Ah, yes, there are 50, 50 men and a kitten in a cave about a mile north of here. And Starboy gets all excited. Starboy finds, sees this one chance. He can get back to the village and warn them. He could become the hero who he always wanted to be, get some notoriety. So he starts running back. Star tries to say, no, you fool. You're so naive. Don't go back. But he couldn't help it. He had to run. And being such a good person, knowing the knight so well, he, he could follow. He could track the warrior. And he followed the warrior all the way back to the chief's hut. And there he finds the chief. He could hear them inside, the, re the report the warrior gives to the chief. And he says, yeah, the boy's there. He's a strange kid. But we saw him. He's, I mean, I saw, I saw him there, and, and uh, he's, he doesn't look like there's anything wrong, wrong to me. And all of a sudden, Starboy starts knocking there at the hut of the chief. The chief says, that's the kid, isn't it? Yeah, it's the kid. Well, what's he doing here? I didn't, I didn't invite him, he must have followed me. So, what they do, they can't look into his eyes. They got this thing, they can't look into Starboy's eyes. So they open up the door and say, put the blindfold on. And the boy puts the blindfold on, ties it up, and then they invite him in. Starboy thinks he's gonna get some honoring, but what happens is really different. What happens is these men drag him in. They tie his hands up behind his back and cords, lash him to a pole, and every time Starboy says, wait, wait, I know something, they're stacking tribe. This, uh, the warrior would take his spear and just go bam, and just keep whacking on him until he just was, he couldn't move anymore. He did this three or four times, and the boy finally figured out not to say anything. So he, the boy is sitting there, and, and the, uh, they're laying there, bleeding. The chief says, I know who you are. I know your past, and I think I know your future. We have people that really want the magic to come back to this village. They want to see sorcerers return, but we've done so well without them. In fact, I remember your parents. They were sorcerers here, and they left us. They betrayed us, and we haven't. It turns out we never needed them anyway. So as far as I'm concerned, you're dead. You'll never leave this place. But the warrior, having a bit of a kind heart, said, why did you come here anyway? 
And the boy says, finally getting a, a way to speak, he says, Sir, if only I could have a station as high as you. But please, just hear me out. If my story is wrong, you can kill me. But just listen. There is a tribe attacking. There are 50 men in the, in the cave to the north. They're the ones that are attacking. They're the ones with the war drums. The chief goes to the warrior and says, Yes? Did you check that cave up there? And the warrior was saying, No self-respecting warrior would ever go into a cave like that. No, we didn't check it. So the chief sends him out. The warrior goes to check the cave. And then talks to Starboy just a little bit again, saying, I hope it doesn't come that we need sorcerers again. And he leaves as well. Starboy is there for hours. Nothing happening. The warrior finally returns and tells the chief, Yes. Yes, there are men there. The boy was telling the truth. So they return to the hut, and they say, your story turns out to be true. And the chief thinks, maybe we could use you in this battle. So they let the boy go, take off each lash, each cord, and they, with his blindfold still on, they open the door, and they shove him out, slam the door, and they laugh that point the boy takes off the blindfold and he's shocked because it's full daylight he runs back to the hut knowing already that there must be sun full on the bottle and he's already broken his promise to his love he gets back there sure enough as surely the bottle is bathed in sunlight it's turning to poison just at that moment he never he never imagined he would break his promise and he never imagined it would just be one day but that's the way it worked out for him Puts the cap on the star, or on, the, on the bottle. He takes it, puts it close to him, and he goes to sleep. And that night, he wakes up again. It's dark. And uh, he does what he usually does. He knows it's poison already, but he takes, it off, takes the cap off the bottle. He looks at it. He goes, well, I got to. I got to. He takes the drink, and it's, whew, it is poison. He can feel it racking through his body. And after a couple of minutes, he hears this voice coming from outside. And the voice says, you forgot me. Already you forgot me. And he looks out the door. And he doesn't see the star, the, the same woman. He sees some eyes blazing out the doorway. Mm, a little fire going on there. And, and he goes out to look, and, and he sees her. And she smiles at him still, but her teeth are a little sharper. And he notices that her fingernails have gotten a little bit of talon on them. She's looking pretty. She's pretty, but she's pretty, pretty scary. And he explains to her, please, please forgive me. What had happened was I was taken prisoner. I couldn't get back to you. And there was a lot of love for, of, and star for this boy. And she forgave him. And they began walking, although silent and not, not much to say. But star boy felt so bad. And he's, they're walking through the jungles at this point. And then again, it happens. War drums. And the closer this time. And arrows start, fly, arrows start flying around. And Starboy is not exactly the courageous one. He jumps onto the ground, screaming, I'm hit! And she says, you fool. Get off the ground. Run back to your hut. You'll be all right. I'll take care of it. So he runs back to his hut. And he see, looks up into the stars. And he sees fire coming down out of the sky. He sees shooting stars. And gradually, the drums start dying down and dying down until it's total quiet. He waits for Star to return to the hut. She doesn't come back. And, he's, and there's something about the poison is making it difficult for him to stay awake, so he, he does fall asleep. And then he do, but he wakes up just in time to put the cap on the bottle and put it away. And about two hours later, he hears a pounding at the door. Boom, 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 boom. And it's the chief and the warrior. And they say, Starboy, you're a hero. You've, I don't, we've never met a man, never imagined a sorcerer could be so powerful to bring down fire from the skies. And, they, uh, and he opens up the door, and, and they're like, you know, not one to look at him. And then one of them has a blindfold, and so he gives him a blindfold, and ties a blindfold up. And, and, and they lead him then, um, and they march off to the village. And there in the village, they have prepared for Starboy to give them a speech because they all want to meet this boy that saved their village from these attackers. And he's got his blindfold on there, and he starts really 
boasting about how wonderful he is and how badly they need him. this opportunity to be a part of your town. Thanks to all among you who fed me when I was young. It's you who made this possible, possible this day. Well, you know, that can't go on for long. Something's going to happen. He's boasting and boasting. He's going, yes, it's me. And the bottle he has in him and his pouch falls onto the ground and just in broad daylight. And he's got his blindfold on. He doesn't know how he's trying to... He takes his blindfold off, scares everybody because they don't... You know, they still got this thing about looking his eyes. They all scatter. He picks up the bottle and goes, oh, no, I did it again. And he pulls it towards him and he runs off to his hut. And once he's in his hut, he sobs and sobs and sobs. For not only has he betrayed his own people by lying to them, that was his power that saved them, but he also may have lost the only love he ever had in the star. <clears throat> so... He waits. What can he do? He waits. He doesn't want to look. He doesn't, does not want to appear in that village again after that exit. And he knows that that bottle is full of poison. But you know, he has nothing to lose, he feels. He opens it up. Even with all the poison now that's in it, he drinks it. He drinks it anyway. And sure enough, like clockwork, guess who appears at the door? And she says... All you think of is yourself. That's it. I am out of here. And she has this magic rod 
she throws on the ground and it springs up into this beautiful silvery tree right up into the sky, just farther than he can see. And she starts climbing up very, very nimbly and very fast. And, she, and he goes to follow her. He got, you know, he's, he's afraid of heights, but <laughs> nothing's going to stop him. He can't help it. He starts climbing up after her. And she says behind him, don't follow me. Don't follow me. But he can't help it. But he's nowhere near Matt's for climbing this thing. And she starts getting further and further and further away. And the only thing that seems to help him to be able to climb this tree, well, as you guessed it, he takes another drink of this poison. And it seems to help. He can catch up a little bit, but he can never quite catch up with her. And he gets so far up into this tree that he starts entering a whole different world that they call the upper world. In this upper world, there are dragons flying around. There are crystal palaces around. And it's like, whoa, totally wild for him. And then these people know who he is. They say, oh, you're the star. You're the boy with the, uh, with the bottle. Yeah, yeah, we, we've heard about you. And then it gets weird, scary stuff, like these skeletons are come up. And they start dancing in circles around him, scaring the kajibis out of the poor kid. He has, you know, he's a kid from the jungle. No idea what all this is going on. Things are happening too fast. The images are flying too fast. And at one point, he notices that Star has disappeared into that little point of light. He knows her. He's always known her as. But he praised her like he used to back down on Earth. He said, please, Star, please, Star, come back to me. And she answers him from a distance. You can hear her say, you need to go back down. Go back. You need to purify yourself. And so he was okay with going back down and getting away from all the skeletons and all the bizarreness, the real weird carnival. And he starts on his way back down. And it takes a long time. The boy is terrified. He's clinging to this tree the whole way down. And all he really cares about now is getting there and touching the earth again. And as he climbs down, he starts feeling weaker and weaker. And as he gets weaker, his head starts to throb. It starts to hurt. It feels like his skull is going to explode the closer he gets to earth. You know, we're talking more than a hangover here. We're talking big poison. As he gets down, he finally gets to touch the earth with one foot. The bottle slips from his hand, hits the ground, shatters. His other foot hits the ground, and he falls down, and he dies. That's the story. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can we have more for our singers from Orlando Opera, Aaron and Jeanette? Thank you. Thank you. 